Hello, my name is Jan Ellenberg and I head the Cell Biology and Biophysics Unit at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg. Today we want to talk about high throughput microscopy for systems biology. Now the motivation for such studies is that cells carry out many essential functions in life. This is illustrated by this panel of different cell types on this image and each of them actually has multiple essential functions that it's carrying out. Now, if we want to understand molecularly how these functions work, the first task we have is to identify the genes responsible for these functions. So even for very basic functions of life, such as cell division, which is depicted here, going from interphase to prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and cytokinesis, the main goal of which is genome segregation, we don't know all the human genes and what they do for cell division. Now that that's the case was a very sobering recognition after the sequencing of the human genome a few years ago, where we knew that we had 23,000 protein coding genes in our genomes, but only for about 100 at the time had a function in such a basic event as cell division been demonstrated. Now we knew from model organisms such as the roundworm C. elegans that over 300 genes are required for division. So clearly we were lacking a lot of the knowledge in human to understand this process comprehensively. So how do you go about identifying genes for essential functions? The first thing you need is you need a way to inhibit the function of the gene. The most popular way of doing that is to use RNA interference. Libraries of small interfering RNAs that either cover the whole genome or certain subsets of it to inhibit the expression of a gene one by one and record the phenotypic consequence of that. Now an alternative is to use overexpression, putting genes into cDNA constructs to artificially increase the gene dosage and thereby perturb the function. And more recently, very popular is also to use specific chemical inhibitors in drug libraries or also unknown target libraries to systematically inhibit gene functions. Now today, for simplicity, I will give examples using siRNA libraries to silence the expression of genes. Now if you have such a genome-wide siRNA library for the human genome, the next thing you need is an assay that can report to you whether the cellular function of interest is affected if a gene is silenced or not. So I will use the example of cell division. For simplicity, it's a quite typical cellular function. It's essential. It's dynamic in space and time and we can report on it easily on a microscope here using the core histone 2B fused to green fluorescent protein. Now in this image of a cell you can see the bright green nucleus which is where the chromosomes are and the chromosomes consist of DNA wrapped around histone octamers and one of these eight proteins in the histone octamer is histone 2B tagged with GFP. So in every single cell in the field we can see where the genome lies inside the cell and we can also immediately see the function we're interested in cell division is rarely detected because the cell cycle takes about a day and cell division in this cell here, it's visible, only takes about an hour. But if we record these cells alive on the microscope for about a day, then every single one of them that was resting at the beginning of the movie will go through the normal division process and tell us if genome segregation occurred accurately or not. This is a control situation where no gene is silenced and we can see the cells dividing normally on the microscope. Now we can compare that to a situation where we silence a particular gene, a positive control gene, pololike kinase, silenced by a specific siRNA. Already the first image shows us these cells are in a different state than the controls. They arrest at the prometaphase stage of mitosis with condensed mitotic chromosomes. And if we run the movie, we can see they arrest like that for several hours before they realize that genome segregation is impossible without the activity of this enzyme and they die by controlled cell death, fragmenting their surface and their DNA. So that's the kind of phenotype we are interested in if we want to find genes required for cell division. Now how do you do this across the entire genome with 23,000 protein coding genes? For this, we need to develop technology, and the first technology is to deliver silencing reagents in high throughput to cells on a microscope. So for this, we put together a microarray platform 
which is assembled inside live cell imaging chambers. And each spot on these microarrays now contains a different siRNA, silencing a different genes. The entire human genome with about 51,000 siRNAs can be spotted on only 150 microscope slides. And therefore, in a few experiments, you can go through the entire human genome, silencing in the cells cultured on these microarrays each single gene one by one. Now, the next piece of technology you need is the focus of this lecture, is a high-throughput microscope. So we need a microscope which is fully incubated, so the cells are dividing as happily as in the incubator, and the stage of which can accommodate, in this case, up to four of these microarrays, allowing us to image about 1,500 such gene silencing experiments in parallel. Now, we are recording movies for two days with a time resolution of 30 minutes, so the one-hour event of cell division is never missed, resulting across the entire genome in a data set of 260,000 movies or 34 terabytes of digital data. So this really is the technology challenge one of high-throughput microscopy to record such large amounts of data with reproducible quality in an automatic fashion. But immediately after, we have a computational challenge with the data. Before we come to that, we take a step into the lab and actually look at the operation of a wide field fluorescence time-lapse microscope in screening operation. We see here a fully automated wide field time-lapse fluorescence microscope in a temperature controlled box imaging each sRNA spot of the four microarrays with a time resolution of 30 minutes for two days. Cells are stably expressing gfp tech H2B highlighting the cell's DNA throughout the cell cycle. The data that such a microscope produces looks like this. In the background, we have the entire field of view of a 10x objective. The dashed line indicates the spot where the siRNA was deposited, in this case, silencing the gene kinesin 5, which is again a known mitotic component for reference. And in this rectangle, we have zoomed up this area of the experiment for simplicity, where we can now see cells dividing for two days, or rather not dividing, because you can see, similar to polar kinase, these cells arrest in mitosis at the beginning of the movie and then undergo apoptotic death by fragmenting their DNA. So this again is another example of a mitotic phenotype that we would like to find automatically, but we have to find these genes that have such phenotypes in the 260,000 movies that we recorded. So that requires automatic and unbiased computation analysis. How do you go about doing that? You take a stepwise approach. The first thing the computation analysis does is to segment the image, finding the individual cells that can be very different brightness depending on whether they divide or not, and defining the outline of each of the nuclei of the cells. Now, after that, each cell computation now is one object in the compound image, and a human expert can annotate what set cycle stages the different cells were in when the movie was recorded. For example, interface, mitosis, and apoptosis. Now the computer then extracts from each of the cells about 200 features that describe the shape and the labeling and the texture of each of the cells. And by comparing the features between the different annotated classes, it can make quantitative distinctions. This is illustrated in this feature plot for two such features. Here we look at how round a cell is and at the standard deviation of the gray values inside the cell, which means how evenly labeled the cell is. You can immediately see from the scatter plot, apoptotic cells in red are very different from interface and mitotic cells because they are no longer round and they are no longer evenly labeled for their genomes, which is fragmented. So if you imagine 200 such parameters, you have a very powerful automatic classification algorithm that can, in fact, in the entire genome-wide data set, differentiate 16 different morphological classes. So this allowed computation analysis in a week of 2 billion images of individual nuclei or 20 million movies of cell division events. Now, the classes that are particularly interesting for cell division are either the stages of cell division itself, highlighted here in green, or the consequences of an incorrect division, which are highlighted here in blue.
So how do we find those classes automatically in the movies and also score with statistical significance if they are overrepresented compared to a control situation? Now our automatic recognition of morphologies has transformed the movies now into quantitative data. Each cell has an outline and a color code depending on the morphology recognized. Here we will focus on individual nuclei and interface, cells with two nuclei after a failed cytokinesis event, and cells with more than two nuclei after a second failed cytokinesis event. If I run the movie, you can see at the beginning many green cells, then taken over by many binucleated dark blue cells, and at the end of the movie, many light blue cells with more than two nuclei. So this can now be plotted quantitatively, where we plot the percentage of cells in a particular morphological class over the two days of the movie. And you can see exactly as in the movie, the green interface cells disappear, the dark blue binucleated cells appear after one day, and the light blue more than two nuclei cells come up after two days at the end of the movie. Now to measure again in 260,000 experiments which gene was actually now specifically affecting morphologies representing cell division defects, we need simpler measures than a plot like this. So what we score is the maximal penetrance of a mitosis relevant phenotype at any time point in the movie here for binucleated cells after about a day of the movie representing many cells that look like this or like that in the movie. We compare then this difference to all the genes that we have silenced in the entire genome, scoring their penetrance in the genome-wide distribution. And if the sRNA causes a deviation more than two standard deviations away from the whole data set, we say it is a real hit. It significantly perturbed this morphology in the movie. Now we then add to the binuclear morphology the other morphologies relevant to mitosis, mitotic arrest and delay, polylobe nuclei or grape-shaped nuclei. And if we sum all these sRNAs together and map them to the genes in the human genome, we come to about 1,200 hits from the primary screen. We then validate whether these hits are reproducible by having at least a second sRNA that gives the same phenotype in the movies, coming to a set of about 572 validated genes that reproducibly with two independent reagents perturb mitosis. So that's the set of genes close to 600 rather than 23,000 that we should work on if we are interested in cell division. Now the movies that we recorded contain a lot more information about the genes than a simple score, is it a hit or not? And we would like to use that information to predict which genes have common functions in mitosis and which genes have different functions in mitosis. But in order to do that, we need to measure how different the movies are from each other. And that's not so simple as scoring if NSIRNA has a significant phenotype. So for this, we have to transform our data. Here's the plot that you already saw before. We have the percentage of cells over time. And for simplicity, we plot only two morphologies, binucleated cells and polylobed cells. In this movie, first you have binucleated cells coming up and later polylobed. In this movie, also both of these classes come up, but the polylobed are first followed by the binucleated. So these are biologically two different results. However, most computers would say these are very similar because both classes are overrepresented with relatively similar kinetics over time. Now to see the order of events, we need to transform this data into a trajectory representation where we plot the polylobed class directly against the binuclear class and we use time as the implicit parameter to link two data points together. Now in these two trajectory plots, we can see immediately that these two experiments are very different. And to measure the difference between them, what we need to do is we need to transform the data into two vectors that connect the two different points in time. These are two because we are scoring two cell cycles over two days. And then between these vector pairs, we can mathematically measure the distance here in, with two morphologies, but at, in a very similar way with 16 morphologies, which are all the morphologies we measured. Now these distances can then be used to transform the data into a heat map. This heat map measures now functional similarity between the genes. So the dendrogram here 
shows the relationship between the genes based on the distance between the vector pairs, and the heat map visualizes that distance for the human eye. Each column shows how overrepresented a particular morphology is. Let's take cell death as an example. The darker blue, the more cells exhibited cell death. The lighter towards yellow, the less cells did that. Each column has a timeline for the two days that we recorded, so we also can see when a particular phenotype appeared. You can see this clustering really groups genes together that have similar phenotypic signatures in the movie, and that means these clusters should predict common function of genes in a particular process in mitosis. So let's zoom in on one of these clusters, the first one boxed here in red, where at the beginning of the movie we have a mitotic arrest phenotype followed by a polylobed phenotype indicative of aberrant chromosome segregation, and at the end of the movie the cells are dying because of cell death. This cluster contained genes that were already known to play a role in mitosis in the assembly of the mitotic spindle, the central structure made up of microtubules that segregates the genome. So this prediction for the new genes we found needs to be validated. To do that, we performed a secondary screen where we visualized the microtubules directly on the confocal microscope. So in red, you can see again the chromosomes, which look like in the primary screen, but now we have a second fluorescence channel in green where we can see the microtubules directly in these cells after the same genes are silenced. And wherever an arrow is pointing, we can see defects in the process of spindle assembly. The spindles are not forming normally or not forming at all, as in this case, end cell division fails as a consequence of that. So the secondary screen that visualizes directly the predicted function can confirm that these genes truly belong together functionally, but it doesn't yet tell us what the molecular mechanism was that underlied this particular common function. So in order to do that, we now have a better hypothesis that microtubules in the mitotic spindle are somehow affected, and we can again use high-throughput microscopy to understand mechanistically what this phenotype is due to. So here we make use of another reporter protein called EB3, again tagged with GFP, and EB3 has the property to bind to the growing tips of microtubules. So in a short 30-second movie of EB3 on a confocal microscope, we can see the growth trajectories of the microtubules within the cell. If we track this data automatically in the computer, which is shown here, by projecting the computer tracks on the time projection of the movie, we can extract quantitative parameters about microtubule dynamics from this data. These parameters are, for example, the average growth speed, the length of the microtubules, and their lifetime. This can now be done again on automatic high-throughput confocal microscopes, and we can do it for all the genes where we predict and validate it in the secondary screen that they affect the mitotic spindle. So putting all that data together then again can be done in the form of a heat map where blue means one microtubule parameter was reduced, yellow means it was increased, and white means no phenotype compared to control. And we can see for this set of spindle assembly factor genes that most of them perturb microtubule dynamic parameters, and again we can cluster them by the similarity in which way they affect microtubule parameters now giving us very detailed hypothesis to really understand molecular function. Now, in what I showed you so far, I've led you through the workflow of high-throughput microscopy applied first to a genome-wide RNAi screen for basic cellular functions such as cell division, then a secondary screen to validate for one particular cluster of the discovered genes that it truly is involved in this function, and a tertiary screen that then shows you molecular detail in the phenotype. But all of these examples are linked to mitosis, and I want to make clear that the technology platforms that are used to do this are completely generic. And so this is another example where we can use the same method of genome-wide screening, secondary screening, and tertiary screening to validate predictions for a completely different cellular process, which is protein secretion. The whole process and workflow of a genome-wide as RNA library computation analysis of the data and automatic data acquisition, secondary screening, clustering, network construction and validation is generic. It's the same for any cellular function. What you need to do is you have to change the assay on the microscope 
because now the function that you want to visualize and assay is very different. We want to study how proteins move from the endoplasmic reticulum to the cell surface. So Rainer Peppercock's group here at EMBL who carried out this screen used an antibody that can visualize if a protein is delivered to the cell surface, if a particular gene is silenced where this delivery is impaired, we can see that by the absence of the signal on the cell surface and can again quantify this in the microscopy images. So this genome-wide study has led them to understand for about 150 genes in detail what they do in the secretory pathway, a completely different cellular function. So these methods really can be used to understand any function of cells that can be visualized on a microscope. Nevertheless, also for this study, we stay at the genetic level of information. We understand the genes required and we understand in detail their functional phenotypic profile. But eventually we need to move beyond that and study directly the proteins. Before I tell you how we do that, we move again to the lab and look at an automatic microscope for immunofluorescence-based assays, which doesn't just automatically image, but also automatically dispense reagents using a computerized dispensing system. This automated confocal fluorescence microscope is equipped with an on-stage liquid dispenser. The chemically fixed cells to be stained are first washed with buffer. Thereafter, the first solution containing fluorescently labeled antibodies is applied to the cells for staining. After staining, cells are washed again. Following the autofocus and auto-exposure adjustments, cells are automatically imaged in 3D. Finally, the fluorescent labeling is bleached away completely and the whole procedure is repeated for another antibody. Automatic immunofluorescence microscopy allows labeling and imaging of up to several tens of organelle markers in the same cells in parallel. Now back to the lecture. We would like to move from the genetic to the protein level to understand how cellular functions are carried out. And again, we can use high-throughput microscopy in order to characterize the proteins encoded by the genes we identified. So far I told you about RNA screening, how it can identify genes and how it can provide a lot of information about their phenotypes. But once we know the genes, we need eventually to look at the proteins. And for many cellular functions that are regulated in space and time very intimately, this is most useful to do in the context of the intact cell. So again, we turn to imaging and biophysical measures to understand, for example, where do these proteins localize and where and when do they interact during the biological function we are interested in. And having such data, we hope we provide enough information to propose models about the molecular mechanism of how these proteins are carrying out the essential cellular functions. So I want to briefly give you a glimpse of what the technologies are that can be done in high throughput on a microscope to characterize proteins systematically. Now, the first information we would like to have about cellular protein networks are systematic localization information. Because where a cell has its protein localized is often informative about the function of the protein. Now, to do this, let's go back to the example of cell division, which I used at the beginning of the talk, where we had about 600 genes. So what we now need is we need to GFP tag the proteins encoded by these 600 genes, put them into cell lines, and multiplex the analysis in multi-well plates. Now the assay for localization then would be high throughput, high resolution confocal imaging in three dimensions over time, record many such movies of the different proteins, and then derive in the computer the co-localization and construct the localization networks.
So in order to do that, we need, again, microscopy technology. But before we put cells on the microscope, we have to express the fluorescently tagged version of the protein we are interested in. And to make sure that fluorescently tagged version is also working, we first need to demonstrate that it is working by rescuing the RNAi phenotype. So to tag the protein, what we use is the orthologous gene from mouse, which is automatically resistant to the human siRNA. We tag it at the last exon using GFP, and then we introduce it back into the human cell line that we used for the primary screen. So in the primary screen, we had many mitotic defects, either during mitosis or after mitosis. Now the rescue cell lines are the same human cell line that have the mouse RNAi-resistant gene to complement the phenotype, and you can see all the post-mitotic nuclei are now normal. So that means these genes are working, and it's useful to look at the localization of the encoded proteins. Now, we want to do that not just throughout the entire cell cycle, because we already know the function is critical during mitosis, so we want to focus our analysis on cell division only. In order to do that, we have to make the microscope more intelligent than the microscope for the genome-wide screen. And to do that, we have developed a software platform called Micropilot, which is open source available, which allows the microscope to automatically focus the cells, take a low-resolution pre-scan image, make an online real-time prediction of which cells are about to divide, and then go into high-resolution mode in order to record just the dividing cells. So this works in practice. Here is such an overview image of a field of cells. One cell that the computer predicted to divide. The microscope then automatically zooms in on top of that cell and checks whether the protein of interest is actually expressed in the GFP channel. And if that's the case, it launches a 3D time-lapse movie of the dividing cell. So with this intelligence on the microscope, we can record such difficult experiments as a 3D movie of cell division in high throughput automatically. And so we want to go back to the lab again for a moment to show you one of these automatic high throughput systems that are intelligently controlled in operation. The high throughput confocal microscope scans the sample first to rapidly acquire low resolution images of the nuclear cherry H2B labeling. Acquired pre-scan images are then analyzed by the Micropilot software in order to identify cells that are going into mitosis. After the cell of interest is found, the microscope settings are changed to zoom into this cell and to acquire high-resolution 3D multicolor time-lapse image series. The data that such a microscope produces then looks like this. Here we have a panel of cells that we all caught automatically at the beginning of the mitotic process. You can see prophase condensed chromosomes here in our red reference channel of histone 2b tagged with M cherry. And in green, we can see the localization of all the different proteins of interest that we know have mitotic functions. So where they are during mitosis should be informative for what they do. And you can see the patterns are very different. Some proteins localize to prominent mitotic structures like the central spindle or the kinetochore. Other proteins are in places where the function is not immediately obvious, like the cell surface or simply just the cytoplasm. But we can again use the dynamic localization information to predict which proteins are most similar to each other, and if they are in the same place over several stages of mitosis, probably also interact with each other. But how do we do this if we have this data for 600 proteins? Again, we need to use computational tools. And what I can do today is not yet present you the end result of that, but I can present you what the strategy is to integrate dynamic 3D localization data. The input data we have is like this. We have 3D data over time of dividing cells. We perform these experiments in a cell line that, again, 
gives us landmarks. Now here's our old friend landmark chromosomes labeled by histone GFP. But in addition to that, we need to know where the cell is ending. So we have a landmark on the surface of the cell and we want to know the position of the mitotic apparatus. So we have a landmark on the spindle pole as well. All these three landmark proteins are tagged in the same color, cerulean or cyan fluorescent protein, and are therefore taking up just one channel on the fluorescence microscope. Now our protein of interest that we want to probe its localization of is tagged in M-cherry. In this case, localizes to the mitotic spindle and now needs to be described quantitatively in order to compare it to other proteins in reference to the same landmarks. So what we do is for each cell and time point to extract again quantitative features that describe the localization at that time point of the protein of interest that have to do with its spatial location, its distribution, the morphology of the labeled structures, as well as the texture inside the cell of the fluorescence channel of interest. So these extracted features then allow us to cluster the data again so we can compare different cells at different time points that are now single data plots in such a feature plot. And the differences between different groups can be again trained by supervised classification of proteins that have known localizations. So that then allows us to go for an individual protein in an individual dividing cell, look at the feature parameters and map it to a cluster of proteins that have similar dynamic localization properties. Now the prediction would be that all the proteins that share these properties are indeed interacting. So the output of this prediction is a prediction about protein-protein interactions. Now this is only a prediction because the confocal microscope has a resolution of about 200 nanometers that is not sufficient to demonstrate direct interactions. So that means if we want to validate such protein interactions, we need to turn to methods that can provide this information directly. And so these methods then are really biophysical methods that look at the properties of individual molecules. So what we need to do to validate interactions systematically is record single molecule fluctuations in high throughput in order to extract the network information from this data. What does this technically require? It requires a lot of cell culture to make now not single but double knock-in cell lines that has the predicted protein pair tagged in GFP and M-cherry. These can again be multiplexed on multi-well slides and then we need to perform automatic high throughput fluorescence correlation spectroscopy that I will explain in a second, record many thousands of spectra and from that data extract in the computer the interactions during cell division systematically to finally assemble an interaction network during mitosis. Again here we don't yet have the end result but I can show you how this technology works because the automation has already been achieved. So first of all the principle of fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. An FCS microscope is in essence a normal confocal microscope that has two different features. One is the confocal laser beam is not scanning the cell to generate an image but it's rather stationary at one position in the cell. The other feature is that the detectors used are very sensitive and have single molecule sensitivity in terms of the photon count. Now the beam of the laser can be focused to a very small volume into which only a few fluorescently labeled proteins fit. The data that you record in FCS then is the fluctuation of these molecules through the focused laser beam. So the data you get is fluctuation data over time. You can analyze that data in different ways that I will not go into detail here because we focus on high throughput microscopy. But from that data, you can extract the concentration of molecules, their diffusion constant, and whether two proteins tagged in different colors are interacting with each other. So in order to run FCS automatically, a key ingredient is automatic water immersion over long times. And we will step out to the lab again to look at how automatic water immersion microscopes are actually working. The cap on top of the objective is filled with water automatically. Then the turret moves back to its initial set position. The focus is adjusted and images and FCS data are acquired automatically.
To keep the water level constant, refilling occurs at regular intervals. Now the data that this enables us to generate automatically looks like this. Again, we use MicroPilot in order to automate the process intelligently so that we record fluorescence correlation spectra from cells that are in the desired cell cycle stage, for example, G2, and that have the co-expression of the two markers we are interested in, a red and a green fluorescently tagged protein, also in the right concentration to be useful for FCS. MicroPilot then automatically segments the cells in both nuclear and cytoplasmic compartments, automatically positions the laser beam into the different compartments, and then automatically records the fluctuation data here in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm, and performs automatically the autocorrelation analysis to extract here the residence time of the molecules in the laser, indicative of their diffusion mobility, and the number of molecules indicative of their concentration. So measuring this for hundreds of cells, we can very quickly compare the mobility of proteins in either the cytoplasm or the nucleus to each other with statistical significance and also determine their concentrations very accurately. This is one level of proteomic information, but the most interesting actually is if the red and the green molecule move together through the laser beam, which would indicate that they bind to each other. So in order to do that, we analyze the data a little bit further. We record the red and the green labeled protein at the same time on two different detectors in terms of their fluctuation. Here, an example with an H2B M cherry tagged reference and an H2A variant YFP tagged protein of interest. If we look in the cytoplasm, we can see the fluctuation curves between the red and the green protein are not correlated, so the black cross-correlation curve shows no significant amplitude over background. However, if we look in the nucleus, where these two proteins are part of the same protein complex, we can see there's strong correlation between the red and the green protein, and the black cross-correlation curve now is very significantly elevated above background, indicating a physical interaction between these two proteins in the same moving particle. So this kind of technology now applied systematically to many green and red tag protein pairs allows us to measure interactions of proteins in living cells at the time point we are interested in and in the compartment we are interested in by intelligently controlling the FCS microscope. So we hope in the long run that high throughput microscopy will really allow us to measure many such proteomic parameters, not only score the phenotypes and the genetic requirements, but also characterize in detail biophysically and biochemically the proteins that carry out these functions. By integrating all that data in the computer, the vision is that we are going to be able to construct a Google cell, which is not like Google Earth, a static map of the components of the cell, but rather a dynamic map of how these protein components work together to carry out the essential function of life. Now, before I close, I would like to acknowledge the people who contributed to the work that I presented to you. This has been a collaboration for many years between my own group and Rainer Peppercock's group, who heads the Advanced Light Microscopy Facility here at EMBL. For technology development involves our mechanical and electronic workshops and also involves constant interaction with our industrial partners who are willing to make modifications on their microscopes, most prominently Leica, Zeiss and Olympus. The names highlighted here in green from Reiners and my own team have made major contributions to many of the publications and many of the unpublished data that I showed you during this lecture. And last but not least, I would like to acknowledge funding from the German Research Council, the Human Frontier Science Foundation, and the European Commission in both the sixth and the seventh framework program. And with that, I'd like to close. I hope you enjoyed the lecture on high throughput microscopy.